This is the traditional way of grazing, just throwing them out on a small pasture and letting them roam over it all summer long. But uh, we've kind of changed our way of thinking and the simple fact that drought was basically the adversity that we came up against. We weren't willing to sell all of our cattle and our livelihood, so we decided we had to do something about it. So we, we started subdividing and, and changing our grazing strategy, and it's been good to us during the drought. This year we did see some rebound and saw a little moisture so we could get a little bit of growth. Last fall, a lot of our neighbors by August, early September, they were already pulling their cows off their pastures and they were taken to a dry lot where they were either feeding them silage, hay, corn, um, basically inputs that cost quite a bit of money to maintain your cattle herd. And if you can keep them going on grass or if you can grow like a cover crop or some forage, it's basically saving us the money of not having to buy other hay or buying inputs to, to uh, keep the cattle going. Here's another neighbor. He hasn't really caught on. He's still doing full tillage. It's wheat stubble and he did tillage on it. He's dissed it. Basically what happens when it rains is you'll see it take in just a very little amount of moisture and then pretty soon it starts running down the side hills and it'll cut small ditches. There'll be a lot of uh, what they call rill erosion, which is just on the surface. And then there'll be a lot of deep ditching that'll wash away because you can tell the ground's just so powdery that it just ponds up on the top. And then it crusts over. This ground hasn't been worked too long, but you can already see you have to dig quite a ways to get to moisture. It's just really dry. When that moisture is gone, that's not going to be able to be used for a crop, whereas a no-till, you might have an inch or two extra moisture that'll get you through to make, make the difference between a harvestable and an unharvestable crop. You know, the diversity that adds to your bottom line and the cattle along with the cropping system is not something that's foreign to the American farmer. Why do guys do it out here? Because they have to. Well, why do they not have cows in the Corn Belt? They don't have to. They don't need the income. They don't have to. Out here, we have to have the extra income because the drought takes away our crop. And if we can't make our payment, the bank takes away our farm. <laughs> I'm a firm believer as a whole that uh, the more bare ground, the more bare fallow we see, the more it does affect our weather patterns. When we have more fallow in our area, we see the rain split and go around us. And I'm convinced that a lot of that's due to the reflectivity of all the heat being soaked up on bare soil or work soil like this and reflected up into the sky. Just makes me sick to think about how much how much damage tillage does. And so I've got to the point where I can't treat my soils like this and, and till. It just, just makes me feel sick inside. And it's gonna take years and years to rebuild that topsoil. So that's something else that I'm pretty adamant about is, is with our cover cropping and with our forage system is incorporating no-till and cover crops on the land to keep the soil covered from wind erosion because whether it's wind erosion or if we got lots of moisture, it'll be water erosion, but there'll be erosion one way or another. And there's no two ways about it. Um, basically what you see here is a conventionally tilled field and all this big area is silted in mud that's come off the hills from tillage. It's water erosion. When we got big rains, there was a big pond here. All the water ran off the hills. And as you can see, a lot of the things behind us back there, a lot of the soybeans is really hurting for moisture. And a lot of it's an infiltration issue. And so basically we have a huge area here that's lost to production, as well as we're losing production on the side hills because of the lack of topsoil. So the problem just keeps getting worse and worse. Well, Michael, your corn's holding. It's trying Mine to. Isn't. It's trying to. It's, it's. Now we got to kind of look at the planting dates here. You know what I mean? I'm a little yeah, later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is some of that ground blue there where it's all burned up. And yeah. It had no ability to take anything in the ground. Hopefully, we'll catch some rain soon. I mean, they're talking like maybe a chance next week, but I don't know if it's going to be enough of one. Okay. Well, we'll see, you, Brent. Okay.
he keeps telling me that you know we're doing better on no-till and that he likes he likes the idea of no-till he's just he's just been doing it too long he just doesn't have enough acres and everything else so he's just gonna keep doing it the way he's doing it so but yeah he realizes that that you know what he's doing is probably not the best but I don't know it's one of those things changing mindsets so tillage has been the norm for their entire lives and some people are so I don't know if it's stubborn or so closed-minded that they won't accept no-till they think that it's some kind of voodoo or crazy thing and and really all it is is it's just better use of the water and being able to use the water when it's there most efficiently. What we see behind us is on the left side it's only been in no-till for one year. On the right side of the field this has been 10-year no-till uh, where they had a wheat crop failure prior. We had a wheat crop, we harvested about a 40 bushel crop which is a fair crop for as dry as it was. Uh, we both went no-till into the wheat stubble after the wheat was harvested the next spring we planted our corn on both sides and basically what you're seeing now is the one year no-till the the water just didn't infiltrate the ground on the other side the longer term no-till there's pore space there's also earthworms there's other kinds of microbial life working to open the soil up and in a drought condition you can really see the difference in the fields I think the, the main thing is that, you know, no matter what you're doing, you've got to try to keep as open mind as you go into it. Because I think a lot of traditional mindsets of it can't work, it won't work, it's too dry here. You know, I propose that subdividing and, and changing our grazing strategy about five years ago. And my dad, he didn't totally go along with it the first year because it was still kind of a wetter year. And then we started getting drier and dad gave me a small pasture about 30 acres and and I had another 20 acres of, of land that was pretty wore out that I planted a cover crop on. I uh, raised 28 heifers on that land and kept them going for about six months and and dad was pretty pretty excited to see what I could do. In the early research of no-till when we first started no-tilling they were telling us you got to worry about compaction you know keep your animals out on the pasture and and you know don't ever dare set the cows out well then we started getting into more uh, people like Dwayne Beck and people that had been doing more that told you well that's not right you know you need to integrate livestock back on the land you know there's a lot of good that the cattle can do by grazing these crops and now we've even moved further and the more I get into this the more we're trying to do more with grazing and keeping the cows out on the ground as long as possible. We didn't see the cover crop coming at that time when neither one of us expanded our cow herds uh -uh. but that's the opportunity. That's why we're, we've switched over to basically doing the cover crops with some grazing intertwined because that grazing you can see an economic benefit right away from marketing of your, of your cattle. Since we've managed differently, we're starting to see a lot of different revenue streams that we wouldn't have had before. I mean, we haven't had to sell off cattle. We've been able to maintain our herd, more profit there. Some of our acres that we couldn't raise good crops on, we've converted to forage land, a, a rotational grazing. And that's another revenue stream as far as being able to turn the cows out there. And I personally am debt free. And a lot of it's because of the grazing. You kind of got to be more, not necessarily open-minded, but you've got to be open to failure. I mean, yep. <laughs> we, we failed. You're going to fail. I've got neighbors that have told me, once you get this figured out, I'm going to do it. Okay. But they're not willing to fail. Okay. They know what works now for them. And if that is a hundred animal units less than what they, they could run on a rotationally grazing system until that system has been figured out and been able to be boxed up. Yeah, they can, just can say, show oh. you how to do it or what to plant as a cover crop out here that will succeed 85% of the time, then they'll do it. They're not willing to fail and, and, and put the money out when there's a chance they might not get a return. Some of it's, some of it's mindset too. I think it's a pride factor that if you, you know, you fail, um, you know, people think that, 
that automatically deems you as, you know, a crappy farmer, or, you know, that you're, that you're a failure. But I think I learn as much through failure as I do through anything else. I mean, you might think they're a mistake this year, but gosh, you know, the next year I've grown the best corn I've ever grown in drought conditions after that. And it starts making you think, oh, well, I must have done something right. And you start looking back at what did I do to this particular part of the field or what did I do differently here? personal responsibility is what this all boils down to whether it's me as a farmer or anybody who's works in in a town somewhere I'm doing the, doing the best you can doing the best you can whether and and that's what we do out here the payoffs not this year or next year it's going to be 15 20 years and like like Clint's probably said we might not even see the full benefit it might be our children or our grandchildren but at least we're trying to leave the leave this land in at least as good a shape, if not a better shape than what we, what we found it in, so. How long have you two known each other? Forever. Since he was this tall and I was this tall. Yeah. <laughs> Forever. We came up to school together. We went to the same school for, well, basically from, you know, when we were growing up in grade school up through high school. So we've known each other for our entire lives. So I used to throw the basketball inside to him. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, we've, we've known each other quite a while. You didn't get your plug for Island Cattle Company. No, Come on, not. owner of Island Cattle Company. No, that's all right. <laughs>